All righty, item J1. Just talk loudly until they stop talking. Okay. Yes, Madam Chair, and uh, hello, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Troy Post. I'm with the Economic Development Zone, and I'm here today with a request for adoption of a resolution that would do two things. Uh, the first is this would uh, terminate an economic incentive agreement that we have with uh, what we call Project Eagle, and I'll explain that in just a second, and would also uh, ask you to approve the sale of a piece of property in the Spaceport Commerce Park, which is in Titusville, to Project Eagle, uh, per a ground lease that was executed back in 2015. So to go back a few years to 2015, we had a project that was brought to us by the state. We worked with the EDC to create a, uh, an economic development incentive package to attract them. The, the project, which was called uh, Eagle at the time, we later found out was Embraer. They were uh, doing a um, seating manufacturing uh, purchase, a company that exists on the West Coast. They were buying that. Uh, the intent of the company at that time was to look at either expanding in their California location or maybe moving to an adjoining state out west. Uh, governor Scott, uh, Rick Scott was governor at the time, really wanted DEO and local partners to try to recruit the company to, to move the operations here. So that was the purpose of this incentive, which uh, asked for two different things. One was to provide up to $2.2 million in uh, uh, economic assistant grants that would help defray the cost of the building. And then there would be the provision of a piece of land, 15-acre site in the Commerce Park, which we had prepared to kind of a rough grade. We cleared it and prepared it to a rough grade, and then the company would take it over from there, finish doing all the site preparation activities and build the facilities. Uh, we were able to um, extend the first part of this assistance uh, to the company, which was $1.1 million. Once they were able to finish their site preparation activities and pour the pad for what we thought originally was going to be one building, it ended up being two buildings on the site. And then the, uh, an additional 550000 was provided to the company once they finished the building and had it uh, certified according to the building code standards in Titusville. So at this point, we've extended to the company $1.65 million. Uh, they've created about 50 jobs. Uh, but recently we got uh, word from the company that they wanted to just terminate the agreement, <clears throat> which in talking with the county attorney's office, it was suggested that if we do that, uh, it would be appropriate to have a written agreement uh, that would be executed by the parties uh, just to protect the county so that there would not be any further claim for the additional monies which could be due to the company if they create jobs. Uh, so. We have before you a termination agreement that would also result in the return to the economic development zone of the 1.65 that's been extended at this point. That money came from the uh, tax increment fund that is uh, allocated to the zone to do its economic development plan. That money would come back into that fund and be repurposed according to what the zone board and the county commission wanted to do. The sale of the property, uh, they have a ground lease, of course. They would want to go ahead and exercise the option to purchase the property that's in the ground lease. They can do that at $25,000 per acre for that 15-acre lot, so it's $375,000. With that sale, uh, that would go into a separate account that is where we deposit monies from the sale of property in the Commerce Park, which can be used to do improvements in the park. So at this point, I'll stop and see if you have any questions. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Lober, second by Commissioner Pritchett. Commissioner Tobia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will be voting for this, and I uh, appreciate the fact that this will result in $1.65 million uh, in, in monies being received back. Um, however, I think this shows that companies do not rely on grants to make major business decisions such as where to locate a, fa uh, a facility or a factory. I believe Brevard is good enough to attract companies like Embraer without the handouts that we, uh, that we provide. Commissioner Pritchett. Before we got Embraer won them, they were going to settle in California or Arizona correctly. And without these incentives, Commissioner Tobia, they, they would have gone there at the time. I am really glad, though, that um, we have put clawbacks in place. So they hit the 50 employee mark, but they weren't hitting the next one. I think they have some interesting things going on. They're, they're still very successful. But I'm thankful that we have these kinds of things in place to where money's returned if, if they don't um, abide by the contract that they agreed to. So um, I, I think this is wonderful. I think it's good government. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item J2. 
Commissioner Mamick a request here? Commissioner Pritchett? Yeah, I, this could be a, a lengthy conversation, so I wanted to request that we table this till August because at one of the meetings we had before we gave um, Brevard Culture Alliance, um, we asked them to come back with a proposal. So I think we, this is a little bit premature, so I think we need that to come back. Then we can have the big discussion at that time. So I, I, that's what I'm gonna move to do today. So I thought that would be the best thing to do before we start taking up a lot of agenda time because I think that's appropriate. So I would like to make a motion to table. I'll second. Oh. I have a motion and two seconds, so I imagine the votes are there. Um, a motion by Commissioner Purchase, second by Commissioner Lober. C Commissioner Tobia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can can we see what uh, tabling would have to do uh, as far as with uh, the TDC, whether or not that impacts their uh, budget coming up? Um, with with you know, will they receive any more monies or? How, what, what is the impact? Should we table it? I guess Mr. I was Kranz? not prepared for this. I think Frank told Good afternoon. So this is uh, the item J2 was the 2019-2020 um, contract with Brevard Cultural Alliance and the Tourist Development Office. Um, it was uh, based on the TDC uh, recommendation uh, placing 50000 uh, in the contract to, to provide to them. At this point, the, you know, the, our budget has been submitted, but it's certainly we can make adjustments. Uh, you know, there's still plenty of time for, for budget adjustments for, for the next year, so should be okay. Follow, follow up, Madam Chair? Sure. Uh, the, the budget that was submitted, uh, that, that had $50,000 as a placeholder in it, is that, is that fair? Yeah, that's correct. We, uh, we used the recommendation that we got for the TDC in the tentative budget proposal that's been submitted. Uh, my concern uh, would be with the lack of a contract. So none of, none of the monies would be expended if we were to table this uh, without a contract. Is that without the monies that have already been extended the, the, without a contract? Yeah, that would be for the beginning of the next fiscal year. So if you table it, we still have two months to get that contract in place. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Commissioner Lober. I just want to add, since Sunshine obviously applies, um, certainly with respect to this item, I, at least at, at um, the point that I'm at today, I was inclined to go for option number three here, modifying the requirement to report the room numbers uh, per BCA suggestion and then funding them at the TDC recommended level. So, you know, obviously if there's something that comes up between now and when this comes back, that could change, but that's essentially where I'm at today. And unless there's something that, that's introduced between now and when this comes back, um, that's where I, in all likelihood will remain. Commissioner Pritchett? tried to turn it off and I couldn't. Oh. Okay. Okay, I have a motion on the floor. I have um, a couple of cards on this, but if we're gonna table it, there's no sense in having them come up. Commissioner Tobias? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I had uh, some things that, dale, uh, that dovetailed off that. Um, Madam Chair, may okay. I uh, uh, certainly uh, mention those things that, that may? Does this have to do with this specific item? like if the tabling or do you want to talk about it after we we vote on tabling it or would you prefer talking about it as we table it i guess <laughs> i guess if it, how related is it it's uh pretty closely related to the bca madam chair okay, so well, I'll, uh, we can discuss it now if, if the rest of the commission's okay with that okay i don't hear any objections go ahead okay uh this is questions for staff uh, madam chair uh, and this is dealing with the, the, the space issue that the county is, is found itself in. Uh, so this would be uh, for Mr. Abate. Um, have you received any requests for space at the Vieira Government Center? Uh, yes, we have. Could you use the space currently used by the BCA for those purposes? Um, their current lease agreement is, I think, until um, <clears throat> September 30th of 2020, but there's a 60-day provision in it. The request that we have is one that um, uh, it was anticipating that the supervisor of elections is, uh, has a need for all three of our conference rooms from early spring of 2020 through the end of 2020 for um, the presidential primary election and all the elections in 2020. So they will need to use the Florida room, the, and, uh, the Atlantic room, and the Space Coast room, which basically provides us no 
no conference or meeting rooms like where the Citizens Oversight Committee meets and a lot of other meetings occur. And so there is that opportunity, you know, if space were available, we would use it for that purpose. We also have a request, you know, part of the budget has a uh, request for additional uh, proposal, I should say, for six additional staff and planning and development. That's going to require a reconfiguration because they don't have the space over there uh, for that staff as well. So those are the two outstanding needs that um, that we have that are uh, are most pressing for us to try to address. Uh, thank you. So uh, as we table this, um, as Commissioner Lober uh, threw out his idea. I certainly would like to uh, mention this one so everyone uh, is prepared. Um, the, the lease that uh, I was referring to was a nominal lease of a dollar for 2,728 square feet currently in the, uh, in the building. Uh, by a four to one vote, uh, we found that the government, uh, sorry, the county has determined that the property located at the Brevard County Government Center Vieira is not needed by the county. It certainly sounds like uh, that has changed, and uh, when we do take up the BCA, uh, it looks like we're going to need to make a tough decision as to whether or not uh, elections or art is more important. Uh, should we not, uh, should more uh, uh, space not become available? So I will be bringing up the, the lease uh, issue then. I hope we, we can look into that. Also, the second part of this is the BCA contract is uh, the fact that there's 70, I think $70,000 in general revenue as to whether or not that can be repurposed outside of that BCA contract. So um, while I will vote for tabling this, I hope the board takes a look at those two uh, items uh, when it comes up again. Commissioner Lober. Just real briefly on that point, I know the State Department of Health is in the process of moving out of the Merritt Island Service Complex. Uh, that's going to free up a tremendous amount of space. So whether we're talking about putting uh, needed folks in Merritt Island or moving BCA, I don't know that space is at such a premium at this point that we really are in a position where we would have to, to kick them out uh, in order to accommodate someone else. I think we can accommodate folks in my building in, in Merritt Island. Well, well um yeah, there is. Now, Guardian Ad Litem is uh, going to be consolidated and moving to Merritt Island. There will be additional space. Uh, for example, the space needs of Merritt Island would not meet the supervisor's needs or ours relative to the meeting space because we have televised meetings, et cetera. It may very well meet BCAs if that's something the board wants us to be looking at. Uh, I don't have what the specific numbers are. I know there is a substantial amount of space and all of it will not be needed by guardian ad litem, so there will be opportunity for uh, for moving uh, someone. If that you know is something the board would look, uh, want us to look at, we will certainly do that. And if, if need be, I'd be happy to do what I can to try to accommodate them. If if that's a necessary change, hopefully it won't be. But if it is, just wanted to throw that out there. <clears throat> okay, uh, if we're going to move to table. We have two cards on this item. So if commission desires, I mean, could we make an exception and let them speak if they choose to? Because, Are they board members well, I know um, Miss Young sits on the, oh, you're okay? Okay. I just hate to have people have sat, sat here for hours and wanting to speak on the item and maybe they can't come back. Tony? Tom. Tom. Sorry, Tom. Yes. It seems only fair since you've, Wait, you've waited, and we can take your comments into consideration. I have waited. What's that? I have waited. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, my name's Tom Powers. I live in Indian Harbor Beach. I am on the TDC's Cultural Programs Committee. Um, I'm here today to try to um, shed light on why we've made major adjustments in the BCA's budget. Um, and I start out by, and you have all the sheets, I start out by giving you a 
a brief summary of what the tourist development tax provides for regarding cultural organizations. And you can see that it says it goes toward. You got to talk in the mic a little bit more, if okay, you don't mind. I'll move this over a little bit. I just want it to be able to. Okay, sorry. It goes toward visual arts, performing arts, and then under those two, there are subcategories. And just to keep myself honest, I've provided you a copy of the ordinance with the appropriate paragraph um, highlighted in blue. But more importantly, this first graph shows the amount of money that was available from the tax this past year and shows the budget, how that money was spent. Now you can see that over half of it went to the Brevard Cultural Alliance. Um, the rest of it went to a, the TDC committee on which I serve, as well as a TDC marketing program and the fund guide. That's where, that's where essentially all that money went. Now, if we take the portion that went to the tourist, uh, the BCA, we see that well over 50% of it was spent within the BCA with the purpose was to go to the arts. Only 33% of it actually went to the arts as grants. Uh, I don't think if you were investing in a not for, uh, putting money into a nonprofit that that would be a good programs percentage. The amount of money that went to the committee that I serve on that eventually went to the arts was 100%. We didn't spend, we didn't have any administrative costs, we didn't have any costs at all, and all that money went to the arts. Now, I think my last sheet here is our proposed budget. You can see we've greatly reduced the amount of money going to the BCA, primarily because we don't think it was efficient in terms of getting the money to the arts. It's been claimed that my committee has been anti-arts. And in fact, if you look at this diagram, you clearly see that our purpose on the new budget is to put more money into the arts rather than less. The, the budget to the arts increases by 100%. And um, I, I, that's my whole purpose here, to justify the fact that we've reduced their budget and the reasoning behind that. And I think, is there any questions? Is it clear? Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so I have a motion on the floor in a second. Did anybody else have anything else they wanted to add? Okay, the motion was to table this item. Uh, when are we tabling it? Till the first meeting in August? Yes. First regular board meeting or the second? August when the BCA gets back with a proposal. I think they're gonna start, Mr. Rittenhouse sent me a letter and I think they're gonna start reaching out to us with, with their proposal. Did we hear what you're saying? I guess so. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse, you sent a letter to me and you guys are working on a proposal, so I thought it would be appropriate. They're going to be reaching out to our offices from what I um, heard, so I, I think we're all going to be getting information and we'll, we'll know when they're ready so we can make decisions. I have a film. I'm just pretty anxious to get it done because it's been months and there seems to be an issue with... There's a lot of drama, as you know, with there, the TDC and the BCA and everything. There is a lot. And I just so don't want to delay data this. In. Yeah, right. I don't want to so, delay it too long. So I think they're on it. I th actually think I have an appointment Monday with, with the board in my office. So I, I think we're going to start getting some information coming in. Okay. So second meeting in August? Second regular board meeting? Will that be enough time? Uh, for the second board meeting in August, then. Is that enough time? I don't have the date, Andy, but... Okay. Okay. Okay, so yeah. I have a... So your motion stands for that time? Yes, okay. ma'am. Second stands. Okay, so a motion and a second to um, table this item until the second me meeting in August. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right. Item J3. Can't hear you. Information technology guy, we couldn't hear him. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to. I'm not to. the expert. People work for me. There. I'm not up here very often, uh, you know, and that's a good thing. Uh, I like to try to fly under the radar. But there's uh, this is something I'm also trying to keep under the radar. You know, there's been lots of uh, data breaches, you know, that's gotten local and national attention recently, and uh, it's got your attention as well, rightfully so. And uh, there's been uh, desires to openly discuss, you know, what our security measures are and what we're doing to prevent us being the next victim. <coughs> and uh, 
I uh, obviously, you know, uh, we prefer not to discuss some of those things publicly, so I talked to the county manager's office and the county attorney to see what we could do confidentially as possibly uh, an executive session or something of that nature. And unfortunately, uh, statutorily, there's no provision to allow that. So uh, we, ha we have an audit committee. Uh, we have uh, an, an audit company that does uh, internal audits on the IT department for security purposes. And uh, those audit findings are given to the audit committee chair only. Uh, after the findings are, are uh, summarized, uh, there's a, a meeting with uh, the county manager, um, the audit committee chair, uh, the auditor, and myself. And uh, those uh, findings are discussed, but uh, otherwise they are uh, confidential and not subject to public record. Um, the desire to discuss this among yourselves is a very difficult thing to do. One on one, I can discuss anything with you that I want, you know, and also you have a uh, uh, county manager as a, as a method to do that as well. But uh, this is a remedy to get around that, so at least one person on the board uh, could have privy to more details about this. And that's really meant if the board wants to appoint someone as the board representative, they could participate in that meeting that occurs between the county manager, the IT director, the internal auditor staff, and the chair of the internal audit committee. That committee and that is provided for statutorily. Commissioner Lober. Just a couple of questions. Um, first, I, I just am curious if everyone up here has been briefed on what led to this item being put on there in a simple yes or no would be? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, and with that said, um, I don't know if you have a preference in terms of who you're inclined to have serve, but you know, I'm certainly inclined to work with you if no one else wants to do it or if that's what you want, but. That's the board's discretion. I think Mr. Lover just volunteered. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's a. I can make a motion. I'll make a motion. And since I don't know much about computers other than how to turn them off and turn them on, I think he would be a great choice. We'll leave Facebook out of the discussion. How's that? <laughs> Ooh, ouch. So I have a motion by Commissioner Smith to appoint uh, Commissioner Lober as the liaison with IT. Second. Second by Commissioner Pritchett. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item J4, Commissioner Lober. Okay, so this is a, uh, an interesting one. The, the short, I know Mr. Denninghoff is, is well apprised of this, and we've had something of a, uh, almost a, a storybook uh, series of back and forths on this particular item. Uh, Sykes Creek Bridge um, is, is still closed. The plans as they currently are involve having a reopening no sooner than spring of 2021. It is objectively hurting the businesses that are out there. Uh, I know we've got at least one individual that's put in a speaker card on this. And essentially, uh, she's gathered, I believe it's over a thousand signatures. I don't recall the, over, over 1,500, I stand corrected, signatures. Uh, essentially encouraging us to do anything possible to get this thing expedited. Uh, and essentially what I'll be asking, and I'll, I'll go ahead and make the motion now, um, pending uh, public comment, to authorize me to draft and send one or more letters to the legislative delegation here in Brevard, to FDOT and or to FEMA, to encourage that the reopening process be expedited to whatever degree is, is possible so that these constituents can get their businesses um, more accessible, essentially accessible to any meaningful degree again. She can certainly speak as to the, um, the specific impact, um, but that's, that's the motion. I have a motion by Commissioner Lober. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor say, oh, I got a yeah. card. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. You don't have to speak. Yeah, you, I'm sorry you waited so long. You probably just wanted to support it. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Go home and have a drink on me. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, I got a bunch of cards for this one. Yeah. Item J5.
Even your dog got tired and left, right? <laughs> no, he's still in the back, but he's tired. So. <laughs> Seems like we've been here for hours. Because <laughs> we have. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, um, Madam Chair, um, Commissioners, uh, thank you for letting me be here this afternoon to talk about our critical needs. Um, I know each of you has the critical needs documents in front of you and has had a chance to look at them. But if you'll permit me, I'd like to uh, go over a couple of them specifically um, in, uh, in our PowerPoint presentation. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, point of order. Uh, resolution 14219, section 10.1, of um, which I'm sure the sheriff is well aware of. Presentations are to be limited to no longer than five minutes and must be reviewed by the county production staff and the county manager no less than 24 hours prior to the meeting. My question is to the county manager. Have you reviewed this presentation? Uh, did you review it 24 hours prior according to policy 14219? Uh, no, I did have the opportunity to review it this morning, um, but I did not have an opportunity to review it 24 hours ago. Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion to waive resolution 14209 <laughs> for the sheriff, but I'm sure he's well aware. I, I was well aware of that, and I was going to ask you if you would make a motion to do yeah. that, Commissioner Dubai. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just going to refrain from commenting. <laughs> I have a motion by Commissioner Tobiah to waive a policy, I guess, that he's never introduced before, but he's sharing just for you, Sheriff. Yeah. And a second by Commissioner Lober. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion I think that's because I told him I loved him earlier when yeah. I was up here. <coughs> so, um, uh, to start out, as everybody knows, I strongly uh, believe that government's first responsibility is to protect its citizens and then uh, as an elected official to be a good shepherd of the taxpayers' dollars. So I'd like to go over with you um, <clears throat> from the initial standpoint um, our operating cost at the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. And uh, as you can see in a couple um, subsequent graphs, we, uh, we continue to operate as one of the lowest and cost-efficient um, agencies in the, uh, in the Central Florida area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although um, our Sheriff's Office calls for service have increased from 411246 to 476,749 uh, between 2014 and 2018. That's almost a 16% increase. Um, our crime rate has continued to plummet. Um, since 2012, our crime rate has dropped 29%. And uh, I can tell you that I just got the latest statistics from our, our analyst team. For the first half of this year, we have seen another 5% reduction in our crime rate. So I think that's a great testament to the partnerships that we have created in the community, as well as to the partnerships we have created with the community where our citizens are aware of how to, uh, how to prevent crime so that our crime rate continues to go down. The graphs that, um, that you'll see it, um, on the screen demonstrate when compared to a per capita, uh, done with a per capita comparison to Polk, Seminole, Orange, Osceola, and Indian River, um, those counties that surround us. We operate uh, much more efficiently than any of the other agencies uh, when compared uh, per capita. And uh, you can see the numbers there for yourself, but I think they speak very well of our team, the job that they do to make sure they're being as efficient as possible in, um, in not only preparing our budget, but in administering our budget as well. Uh, the last slide uh, showed what we um, do on the operation side. This, uh, this current slide shows how our jail operates. And again, in the same comparisons, uh, you can see that we are significantly less per capita, per cost, per taxpayer. We, um, we are significantly less and able to do the job that we're doing, including a 29% uh, reduction in our crime rate with increased calls. <clears throat> As we, as we stand before you today with a list of critical needs, um, I'd like to go over some of those with you and give a little bit of explanation as to why they're so important to our agency and to our continued success in protecting our citizens. Um, the first one is our attrition rate. As you can see on the screen, since January of 2016, 226 sworn positions within the Sheriff's Office have been vacated. 123, or actually 54% of those, have left due to retirement or to seek employment with other agencies with more competitive salaries. That turnover rate results in an increased cost to our agency, not only from a recruiting perspective, but a training perspective and a continued education perspective of, of the retraining that they're required to do, giving um, uh, an increased investment of $9,642 to each person that we lose. And so when we have to bring somebody else in, to, uh, to facilitate the training to replace that person, 
we're already sitting at that almost $10,000 deficit. Um, to, to a matter of point, the Sheriff's Office has not requested any increases to overtime funding, yet as a direct re um, a result of the deficiencies that we have in our, our um, uh, members, we, um, uh, and the number of members that we have in patrol, we have to uh, have increased overtime, which has also been very taxing on our budget and uh, um, making it difficult for us to, um, to, to get the job done. According to the Brevard County Comprehensive Plan, we shall, and I say we shall, um, have, and let me, let me advance that slide, I apologize. According to uh, the comprehensive plan, we shall have two deputies per 1,000 residents. Currently, there is a 60 deputy deficit of compliance within the board's comprehensive plan and design. If you look forward at the projections of 220 um, and the population estimates, that deficit will grow to 80 deputies. The last time that um, anyone stood before you and asked for an increase in deputy funding was in 2004, which was for 32 additional deputies. School safety. Uh, every one of us in the room uh, is certainly aware of what took place just south of us at Parkland, the horrific nature of, of that incident and everything that happened as a result. Um, our legislators went to work and uh, uh, issued mandates for our schools to be the safest schools in the country. The statute mandates um, school security, and uh, our, our partnership with our school board is to make sure that every student, every teacher, every visitor, every faculty member on that campus is safe and protected to the best of our abilities. Um, the, the sheriff's office had 10 school resource deputies prior to the Parkland incident. Today, um, as school year starts, we will have 40 school resource deputies on campus. And I think that is a great testament to our, our team in HR, our team of um, our recruiters that are making sure we're putting the absolute best of the best in our school campuses. I, I will not sit idly by and not let our schools be protected. I, I, I have a, a commitment to make sure everybody's safe and our children are our most precious of citizens. So um, the school reimbursement fund program funds a portion of the financial impact, uh, $2,423,000 with an unfunded um, fiscal impact to the sheriff's office of uh, just over one million. And that's not including the 650,000 in associated equipment and vehicle costs. So as you can see, that in itself has also been very taxing on our agency, but it is paramount that uh, we provide that service to our community. Continuing with our, our needs justification, our fleet. Um, currently there are 850 vehicles in the sheriff's office fleet and uh, we currently have a deficit of 280 replacement vehicles due to funding availability. As a direct result, the utilization of high mileage, less reliable vehicles, our agency is experiencing significant costs and increased in maintenance and repairs. An example, just to, to give you one idea, is um, we operate an inmate transportation to and from all three courthouses within Brevard County. Uh, currently, we are doing that with a 1997 Bluebird bus Pretty sure that um, some people in here may have actually ridden it to school. Um, and uh, it has an excess of 200,000 miles on it. Um, and we're relying on not only getting people to and from their court hearings, but also uh, not wanting to break down out on the side of the road, which puts everybody at risk. So um, we have to do something in, in that arena as well as our overall maintenance arena. Our tasers. Um, as one of our um, intermediate weapons, our deputies, our sworn members carry tasers. And they are a great tool for us that not only protects our deputies, but they also protect our citizens um, in, in their deployment in a lot of uh, different threat matrices that we have. As you look today, um, the Sheriff's Office utilizes less lethal equipment commonly known as tasers, which everybody is aware of. Um, and um, right now there are currently 586 tasers in operation. 75% of them are nine years of age or older. All of them are out of the five-year warranty and replacement batteries and cartridges have been discontinued. Um, this reoccurring fiscal impact to replace them is $412,544. Uh, again, when we say this is a critical need, it is absolutely a vital need to the safety of our deputies, to the safety of our citizens that they are out there protecting each and every day. This is a must have and we can no longer rely for them to work with the antiquated um, system that they have. AEDs, <clears throat> everyone is familiar with the benefits of AEDs we've seen all too often where um, they are utilized to save someone's life just recently. Um, athlete uh, was saved with uh, the AEDs. Our deputies um, carry them and uh, there are currently 588 AEDs in operation. 90% of them are six years of age or older. All of them are out of the five-year warranty 
and the annual recurring physical impact to upgrade operate is $32,000. And when I say something's out of warranty, it also um, lends to that they are out of ability for the organization or the company to repair them, to find parts for them. So again, this is another vital piece of tool that we must have in our job to protect our citizens. Narcan, as everyone has uh, uh, probably watched on May 1st, we uh, took off one of the biggest opioid organizations this county has ever seen. Over 100 people were arrested for distribution of, of opioids. In that one case alone, we took off enough fentanyl off the street that if it was put into a single dose form, it would have been enough to kill everyone in Brevard County. That's what our team is facing out there each and every day. Also, in addition to that, we have to look at how can we help those that are addicted to this substance. Um, when we consider how many times we deploy Narcan, uh, it is an absolute tool to have on our belt. It also goes into the fact that um, the total reoccurring financial impact for us with our Narcan is $42,000. But when you look, um, there's 3,737 Brevard County jail inmates who during 2018 required medical treatment for opioid addiction and the investigative costs relating to overdose deaths. In the last 24 months, we've had 172 overdose deaths in Brevard County. Narcan is another vital tool for our team to carry on their belt. And unfortunately, there is an associated cost with it, but I don't think you can put any type of price tag on saving a human's life. Our partnership accomplishments. Um, as true fiscal partners with our board, and I want to take a minute and commend our county manager and Jill for their work on, on our, their budget and putting, um, uh, working with us to make this happen. They have been great partners, but we try and be great partners as well. Um, the Sheriff's Office is providing solutions and funding for critical operational capabilities, adequate space needs, infrastructure upgrades, and repair needs to, in the form of 542000 to almost 737000 annually since fiscal year 2007. That, that is for debt payments on the acquisition and construction of the North Precinct, our aviation hangar at the Merritt Island Airport, the purchase of the Criminal Investigations Building on Gus Hip, and uh, most recently our CAD RMS JMS system. Uh, that our system we had prior to that <clears throat> was 25 years old, was built in-house. It was antiquated, and they say that everything has a shelf life. Its shelf life had long since expired. So we were um, innovative in working. Our, our uh, then CFO, Greg Pelham, and our chief deputy worked out a mechanism <clears throat> where we could, um, uh, we could get the new system, be able to work to support our citizens, um, and we've provided $7.7 million in debt payments to the board. Um, we also, again, trying to be good partners. We do all of the labor using inmate labor with our work crews lay, um, for the lawn care and maintenance for all county government facilities. 28 properties, 362 acres, and we do that at no expense to the board. The annual board savings is roughly $200,000 um, for that program that we facilitate. An additional 152,000 is required when the sheriff's office is addressing um, uh, the uh, 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 Parkway Complex Communication Center, our 800 megahertz radio tower that requires structural repair and upgrades. Um, we have to have this. It allows for microwave connectivity to the 800 megahertz system, the generator that operates it um, during the course of a power failure, and also the dedicated data circuits. We're, uh, we're working in partnership with that. We also, um, with our great partners at Brevard County Fire Rescue, offered a very unique opportunity to share our IT servers and upgrade their, their Tiburon CAD system. Um, which is uh, also um, uh, at the end of its shelf life. And uh, the option was accepted by this board and allows BCFR to upgrade to a Tyler New World CAD platform, uh, bringing tremendous value to uh, the operational effectiveness of, that, uh, of the fire department. I will tell you that that would not have been possible if we didn't back up to the last slide and uh, us, us getting the RMS CAD system that we were able to uh, be creative in finding the funding for to, uh, to make that happen. So when you, when you look across the board um, at the different things that we're paying for, the different things that we're trying to be innovative in funding, the different things we're trying to do in partnership, I think you'll find that we're one of the few um, constitutional officers that does that and has the ability to do that. And we continue to make sure that we're, we're trying to uh, uh, be good partners in the community. <clears throat> as, we, uh, as we move forward, other critical needs that we have identified that um, are not in our current critical needs resolution 
but are certainly things that um, uh, we, we have to have on our radar screen. Uh, our West Precinct, which is right here in Vieira, with the uh, anticipated growth of Vieira, we are already bursting at the seams. Uh, we do not um, have any more space. Originally, we had more of that building, but um, by the same measure, our public defender was bursting at the seams. So the county worked uh, with us to make sure that they had more room and, and uh, we had what we needed at the time. That worked for the time being, but um, uh, as, as we look, I started to say, unfortunately, with the growth of Vieira, but that is not unfortunate. The growth of Vieira is very fortunate for our community and, and uh, we love to see it happening, but we will have to address a, a new West Precinct. Also, our evidence unit, which is housed in Titusville, we will have to make accommodations. We have purged every piece of evidence we legally can, and we are still bursting at the seams. Um, it's also located in the north end of the county, up at our Titusville complex. So someone traveling, some, one of our deputies in the Palm Bay area <coughs> has to, um, if they're going to court, drive to Titusville, check out their evidence, drive back to Melbourne for court, if that's where they're going, or to Vieira and then turn around and drive back to the complex in Titusville to resubmit the evidence after, after um, they have used it. Um, again, very taxing on our agency, but the biggest concern is that we are bursting at the seams. Uh, and then the Sheriff's Office utilizes the Brevard County Radio 800 megahertz network for public safety communications. Currently, our agency operates 1,645 mo mobile, portable, and base stations radios on the network. This network has been going through its own struggles um, and uh, I can tell you that the major upgrades uh, that will be taking place and then we'll be migrating to a statewide mandatory radio um, standard in 2023. That migration alone, um, with the current radio inventory, we will need to be replaced and uh, over the next four budget cycles, a total fiscal impact of six million plus dollars in radio replacement equipment will be realized. As I said, that is not in the current uh, resolution that you have before you but it is um, uh, something that we have to look at when we consider our five-year plan and making sure that our county manager and his team are aware of what our needs will be. That, um, those are the, the primary things that I wanted to point out. Certainly I'll um, answer any questions you guys might have, but. Um, uh, Commissioner Lober. Some questions for Frank and for Jill, if that's all right, may I? Uh, does anybody have any questions for the sheriff right now? Can I'll pass to Commissioner Pritchett for the meanwhile. Okay, Commissioner Pritchett. Yes, ma'am. Sheriff, I was listening to you go through your um, agenda items, and you're down 280 vehicles. How many deputies do you have vacancies for right now? Um, right now, today, um, I believe 36. And, uh, Chief, am, am I accurate in that? 36, unless somebody has uh, left since we left the office this morning. So you need 36 more deputies? Well, um, that, that's just the positions we're short. We also have our school resource positions that oh, yeah. we, we have filled, and we're, we, we are looking to um, put those positions back into the rope troll. Um, when we took, when we, we take and we put somebody into a school, we still have to backfill that position on the road so that we can respond to calls and, and uh, other, other significant things happening. Okay, you mentioned the growth in Vieira, but has the space growth impacted? your deputy situation any i'm sorry ma'am has i need to get this closer has the space growth affected your deputy situation oh you know um uh, it actually has um and uh it's uh it's impacted us in a way that i don't think any of us kind of imagine because um we're we're losing personnel um uh to their security teams out there we're losing personnel to it um uh type uh, positions and uh, you know it's it's great to see the space center as it's as it's growing and, and revitalizing, uh, but it is taking its impact on us. We're losing people because they pay significantly more for them to uh, to work those positions. Okay, and has there been a, an increase in service needs over the last period of time? And if so, how do you how do you measure this? Um, well, uh, in the very first slide, we we talked about that there's there's been a almost 16 percent increase. Uh, in service and uh, you know we're looking at an increase in calls and those calls um, I, I think are, are actually taking place for a number of reasons one our population continues to fortunately increase and then two um, you're looking at cell phones have added to the number of calls that we take because people are right on scene they're able to make those calls um, immediately and quickly and so all of those things have kind of come together but you know, what, what we do is we try and um, maintain our partnerships. We've put huge emphasis on uh, lowering our crime rate through making sure our citizens know 
what, um, what crime trends are happening so that they can be the first line of defense for them, their families, their home, all of those, those things. So we put a lot of emphasis on fighting um, crime through partnership and then uh, working with our, our other partners throughout the, uh, the country, our local, state, and federal partners. You know, we just took off an individual um, uh, in June who was just indicted uh, this past week. Uh, this individual was, was on, actively seeking online to, uh, to abuse a child, and one of our undercover agents uh, that's assigned to the, the task force was able to communicate with that person. That person actually facilitated it and came here to Brevard County with the hopes of abusing a child. So, um, you know, if not for our partnerships with our federal partners, uh, we, we would not be able to do the things we do. Okay, and then one other question. Um, since I've been on here, would, we're get working on the budget. Everybody's like, oh, but the sheriff's going to turn his in, and it's always been fine. So here's my question with, with that prerequisite in it. When is the last time that a sheriff asked for an increase for an MSTU rollback or a charter cap increase over the millage if, rate? Because I couldn't find one. If I'm not mistaken, it was 2004. Okay. It was the last time that any request for increase in MSTU has been asked for. So this isn't an everyday occurrence. This is very no, specific to the yeah. day. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think it's important to, to uh, understand that our team, and again, um, Greg Pelham, who is um, – our, well, I started to say he's our CFO, but let me add him to the list up there. Um, he left to go to the property appraiser um, as their chief financial officer. And I, I'll stand before you and say that Greg has done an amazing job for me. I hate to lose him, but um, uh, he has done a great job at, at uh, managing our, our budget along with our chief. And so we've, we've kicked the can as far down the road as we can. We continue to kick it down the road on some other of the bigger items that we talked about. But some of these are staring us right in the face, and, and if we don't take action now, we're going to be in a bad way. Thank you, ma'am. That's all I had for the sheriff. Commissioner Smith, were your questions for the sheriff? Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I don't. Well, I guess I do have a question. I just, you know, I have to be honest with you. I've had people on the street, and some people come to my office and vote no. Sheriff's always looking for more money. So, you know, I thought, well, let me see if he has. So I did some digging and. I think most people know we're the ninth largest county in the third largest state. And um, then I thought about, well, not only the population, but you're dealing with, as a, as a safety officer, our deputies, we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of tourists that come here. So we have a lot of people that you guys are charged with keeping safe. And of course, you know, the fact that we have that, that huge swell in population is due to great things like our zoo I mentioned earlier. You triple SA is bringing a lot of people in. The spaceport attracts an awful lot of people. So we've got all these people and yet we depend on you to keep all of us safe. Um, so with your leadership, I, I did some more digging and I discovered that we're ranked in the bottom 10th of counties in per capita spending, which kind of blew me away because you had told me before that you haven't come here since 2000 or 2004 was the last time the sheriff um, had actually asked for an increase. And so then I found out that we're the 61st out of 66 counties. Dade County isn't included because they don't have that much in the way of uh, county uh, operations. But 61st, so that means 60 other counties in this state, including a lot of little teeny tiny counties, have higher uh, spending per capita than we do. That's correct. Yes, so sir. I guess my question to you, I do have a question. So how do you accomplish all this while keeping a lid on spending? Um, you know, uh, we identify our wants and our needs. And uh, I think uh, the best way I can give an example of that is um, we all have wants and needs in our lives. And I always use the analogy that um, I want a Rolex, but I need a watch. And so our team does a great job at um, uh, evaluating how we're spending our money. Um, uh, we understand that while our first job is to protect our citizens, we also have a responsibility to protect our taxpayers. And so we, uh, we try and create partnerships. Um, I think one of the most significant things that we've done that has helped lower our crime rate is creating a partnership with our citizens. Um, our, our citizens are, are the ones that are preventing the crimes, you know, and that's how you truly lower your, your crime rate is, is by preventing the crime. Certainly our team can investigate it and make the arrest, but that's still a number in the box that goes toward our crime rate. So through, through uh, our partnerships, through being innovative in 
our, our ways to, to finance and pay for things such as the CAD system and everything else, um, I think those are the things that speak most favorably to our team. And, and I, I say it a lot and I'll say it right now. Um, uh, when you ask that question, how do we do that? The answer is I'm surrounded by an amazing team and I'm smart enough to stay out of their way. They do great stuff. Commissioner Tobai, were your questions for the sheriff? I mean, we can have him come back up later because I'm sure you no, might. My, my questions were for staff, Madam Chair. Okay, because I have Commissioner Lober first. All right, we might call you back up, so yes, don't go too far. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so, yes. Go ahead. Frank, during the April 9th commission meeting, you were authorized, and I quote, to prepare in your tentative budget for fiscal year 1920 multiple options for ad valorem tax rates, including an option that may, exceed, that may exceed the aggregate rolled back rate in order to provide funding for critical needs identified by the sheriff while maintaining existing service levels elsewhere, as well as an option that may reduce service levels in the aggregate rolled back rate while still maintaining the most urgent critical needs identified by the sheriff. Is it accurate to say that the aggregate is the total of all individual pieces or portions that make up the tax assessed by the county, including departments and MSTUs, um, for example, public works, law enforcement, mosquito control? Uh, yes, that aggregate is uh, made up of the 20 operating uh, tax districts, uh, the general revenue, road and bridge MSTUs, law enforcement, fire control, mosquito control, parks and rec, and the library districts. Thank you. Now, now that we understand what aggregate means, what does it mean when we're talking about the aggregate rolled back rate? That's a statutorily provided for calculation. Um, it's uh, regulated by uh, Florida Truth and Millage, and essentially uh, the rollback rate is the tax rate that would generate the same amount of uh, property tax revenues as approved in the prior year, but you have to take out considerations for new construction as well as uh, uh, prior year TIF payments for areas that are within the dedicate, those dedicated uh, increment areas. So Frank, does the option that the board's being presented with right now today exceed the aggregate rolled back rate? No, it is uh, equal to the rollback rate. I, I wanna talk real briefly about what that means. Does the proposed 1920 budget require the advertisement of a proposed tax increase? Uh, no, it will require a uh, notice of a budget hearing, but not of a proposed tax increase. Why specifically doesn't the proposed 1920 budget require the advertisement of a proposed tax increase? Uh, because we are, we are not above the aggregate rate, and that's what would trigger um, a proposed tax increase under Florida statute. Perfect. A few questions for Jill, if I may. Sure. So I, I think you addressed one of them that I was going to ask, but Jill, does the aggregate that we've already established as not being... Uh, exceeded from the, the prior year rollback. Does that include the law enforcement MSTU? Uh, yes, it does. The percent change from the aggregate during the 1819 is actually a negative 7.62 percent. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. So it would be fair or at least far more accurate to say that taxes are going down by 7.62 percent were this to be approved than that they're being increased by any amount. Is that fair? Uh, so the tax rates for all of the operating taxing districts, with the exception of the law enforcement MSTU, are being reduced. So the, the aggregate, as we already established, is not going up. I, you know, I appreciate this. It, a year ago, I said that I was going to prioritize public safety infrastructure in the lagoon as my, my top priorities. And I, I think today, I'm, I'm hoping that the county commission will take another step to do just that. Thankfully, without raising taxes, this is something that absolutely is critical. We can't have a, a bus with 200,000 miles being the only one that they have in their fleet. Uh, we need to have officers that are, are uh, recruited, trained, and equipped to do the job that we're asking them to do. And I, I think given that it's been many, many years, since 2004, I believe, was the year uh, mentioned, since we've had this the last time, I don't think there's any way in good conscience that, that I can fail to support something like this. So just as I would support any sort of a change along these lines for the firefighters and the EMTs, I have to extend that, that same um, stance because this is all public safety and you know law enforcement certainly is a, a very critical function that is one of the very few core functions of government. So I'm going to be supporting this today. Commissioner Tobaya. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, these questions uh, are for Jill, and I, th I think they come off some of the points that uh, the sheriff made. He, he mentioned that M MSTU had not increased. 
Would a more fair comment be that MSTU hasn't increased over the last number of years above the CPI? Would that be more accurate? That's correct. You don't have offhand what it had increased, uh, what CPI had aggregate over those number of years? Uh, I can tell you that uh, last year uh, for the current adopted budget, the change in CPI was 2.13 percent. So uh, whatever the charter cap rate uh, that that would have generated, that's what was adopted. Okay. Um, and second of all, um, I'm a little confused here. The sheriff mentioned that the last time that there had been a statement of critical need was, I think he mentioned 2008. Maybe is what he said. I think he said 2004. Sorry, 2004. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Um, I'm looking at a 2016 resolution that asks for a critical need. Uh, did this one not pass, or is in fact uh, the last time that a critical need was declared for law enforcement? Uh, just three or four years ago. Uh, in fiscal year 2016-17, there was a finding of critical need. That was on the general fund and two road and bridge district MSTUs. That did not apply to the law enforcement MSTU. Okay. So uh, the critical need statement in here was, was struck. Is that is that fair? Uh, in 16-17? Yes. Uh, I don't have that resolution in front of me, but it was applicable to the general fund uh, if it addressed public safety. It was not on the law enforcement MSTU. Okay. So a more fair assessment to be to, to look at uh, increases in budget would be MSTU increases plus general fund. Would that be a more fair assessment to look at uh, the, the total uh, budget? The sheriff's office does receive general fund dollars and uh, MSTU dollars. Okay. And one final question, and I guess this one would be uh, to Frank. Um, is there a increase in the percentage of offhand uh, general fund dollars that will be going to the sheriff's office this year over last year? Uh, yes, there will be. Offhand, and I should have asked this. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I should have given you that heads up. Uh, do, you, do you know offhand what that would be? Yeah, it's um, it's below 3%. Thank you. Commissioner Pritchett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we have a general fund budget, and then we have MSTUs. And out of this general fund budget, we have to fund the supervisor of election. We have to do our regular general fund items. We have the clerk of courts. We have, we have all the constitutional offices that we have to work through also. And I have to say, actually, I'm, I'm impressed you guys came up with a budget that's at aggregate because, and, and I, I think people do have to have money to do their jobs, and, and Sheriff, I'm gonna be supporting this today. And part of that's because the change in the MSTUs per household at a $1,000 home, it's only $5.13 a year. And, and if you get homestead exemption after that, it goes down a whole lot more. I mean, we're, we're talking pennies for, for a homeowner to create extra safety into our community. And the day we're in, I don't know about you guys, but it's high priority to me. I have eight grandchildren and six children, and I want to make sure they grow up and, and have an ability to live a life like we have. And it's it's an odd day today. It's a crazy day. So public safety is is one of my um, top things also. And I, and it's I've always said that, Mr. Commissioner Lober, along, along, well, all of you guys feel that way too. I'm not going to I guess for a minute you don't feel that way also. But in the midst of this general fund budget that we've put together, um, Ms. Scott's had to increase her budget by over $1.2 million also. It's, it's in there because she's had to bring great security to all of her offices and plus do bilingual ballots. So, I mean, that's a $1.2 million increase. The clerk of courts, and you know, he's very frugal. He's had to increase his budget by over $1.5 million here in the next two years. And this is all things getting absorbed up by the general fund. And I'm actually kind of thankful we have an MSTU we can put this in because otherwise you guys fuss at us saying that we're not being frugal, but we have all of these different um, aspects of county that we have to help take care of. And it's, they're, all, they're all important things. And as far as, you know, we're going to say, you know, we still do certain things we shouldn't. But this commission has very responsibly started weaning a lot of items off that were on the, the budget 
a few years ago. We, we've got one that should be gone here pretty soon where we've, we're putting substantial funds into. And this is what we've been doing. And, and I don't apologize for doing the weaning thing because I don't want to pull the carpet out from anybody that past commissions have promised them funds all of a sudden. I, so I, I appreciate what we've done here. But I, I think this is a good budget. Um, I haven't been through every single bit of it yet. I've been reading through it, especially the, the top notes. But I'm impressed that we asked you guys to come back at aggregate, and you did. And um, Sheriff, I realized from looking at your needs when we went into this, there was going to have to be a bump in the MSTU. There was no way to get around it. But I'm glad it's going right to where it's supposed to. It's not going to come into the county so we can mess with the funds. It's going right into law enforcement. And I always prefer that because then the voters know exactly where the money's going to. And so that's my thought on this. And it, you know what? If, you, if you've if you got a $100,000 home and you get the $250,000 rights up, $2.50 more per year per household to be able to give him more officers and, and automobiles and these things that we have and to keep the officers in the school. So I, I think this is a great budget. And Sheriff, I am very thankful you came up with this. And I'm also glad, staff, that you found a way to do it without affecting road funds and, and infrastructure funds and the uh, water draining issues that we have a lot of. So I, I think this is a good budget and we're in a season of growth and I, I think we're being very responsible with this and I'm gonna be supporting this today. Mr. Abate. Uh, yeah, just one, one comment before I get a call from the clerk. Um, <clears throat> there is an extra $750,000. We put it in general government. It is for the purpose of the clerk for software for case management system, but we didn't add it to his budget. We have it, and when they purchase it, we will pay for it, and then in the second year, we'd pay the second $750,000, just so uh, you know, I, I didn't want him to have to write an email indicating that uh, no, we raised his budget by $750,000. dollars extremely frugal and do a good job. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go to public comments. Chet Ellsworth, and after Chet, Louis LaCosta. Uh, Chet well, Ellsworth, 989 North Highway A1A, number two, in the Atlantic, Florida. Unincorporated Brevard County. One of the newspaper says 153,283 property accounts um, in the municipal service taxing unit. Uh, my concerns are about the uh, legitimacy, the technical legitimacy of uh, this tax, the critical needs tax, and the $1 billion budget that you've. Uh, proposed. Uh, my concern comes from a, a number of reasons, uh, one of which is uh, the, the uh, powers that you have, have have been putting a sheriff's car out there to threaten me on my property that you want to tax. You've sent the 18th Judicial District to terrorize me off the property that you may want to tax that you have taxed. And you have censored my public safety requests for the last six months for an investigation of these matters. Uh, I do w want to address the disinformation campaign that Mr. Lober and Ms. Bentley has been putting on with the, with the newspaper uh, on, on this and that's what it is, disinformation concerning the First Amendment rights, to get around the fact that you've never looked at the audit of the last billion dollars. On it, it states that you have no control, no internal controls. You're, you're out of control. And now you're asking for another billion dollars and you're asking for a tax on it. Now, part of these unoccupied Brevard County accounts is St. Patrick Shores. And you know what's going on out there. I know what's going on out there, and, that, and that's why I'm being attacked. It's because of the banks don't want the value to go down with those cancer victim, victims out there. 
SunTrust Bank, and Wells Fargo. Uh, those concerns uh, should be dealt with by you, not kicked down the road to the EPA, because the EPA doesn't want any of those people out there lowering the value of that one billion. It'll go down in a hurry if it's been known that you guys are snookering a public safety matter that affects the safety of the hundred, hundreds of thousands of people in this area. Um, so I object to the taxes, technically illegitimate at this time. You know, the, the sheriff's got to do, oh, I'm done. Okay, thanks. Lewis, or is it Lois, I'm sorry. I'm going to go with Lois on that one. me the last time, too. <laughs> I did? <laughs> Just come up yelling it next time. <laughs> no. My sorry. name is Lois Lacoste, and I live on 100 Acre Drive in Port St. John. Um, I uh, am standing before you. I appreciate the time that you're uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I am asking you to vote no on this resolution because this is a 5% raise for the Sheriff's Department that will break the tax cap that 73% of Brevard County voted for. The citizens, voters, property owners of Brevard County voiced their opinion when the tax cap was voted on in the 2008 election. Our voices and vote for tax cap should mean something to you. This, is all, this also is not, from my understanding, and I would appreciate if someone can correct me, but this also is not a one-year, one-time issue. This raise will occur over and over again, according to the collective bargaining contract. So this will set precedence for the next two years and beyond. My concern is that this goes against the will of the residents, setting a dangerous precedent for firefighters, emergency medical, and all other departments, some of which have asked to break the cap in the past. The Brevard County Sheriff Department does an excellent job protecting all of Brevard County. But the answer to the request for additional funds is always the property owners that are hit with increased property taxes to fund the request for additional funds, which is especially hard and unfair to all retired homeowners living on a fixed income. I greatly admire, greatly respect, and greatly appreciate Sheriff Wayne Ivey and all his men and women of our Brevard County Sheriff Department. However, I do not support breaking the tax cap to honor their request. Therefore, I respectfully ask you to vote no on this resolution. Do not raise my property taxes above the legal cap. Thank you. Thank you. Diana Schomer, Shom and then Barbara Green, Gorin, Barbara Gorin. Miss Wrighty, how do you read that? Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, my name is Diana Schomer, and I live on Merritt Island. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud. I know you think it's bad that we come in, like, fifth or tenth or something in what we spend for what we get. But I'm really proud of what Sheriff Wayne Ivey does with the money. I think he manages it better than all the rest of the people do. Not that we, sh you know, should give him so much more, but... Um, but I think, I think his request should be met. Um, I just think that the money should come from things that we don't need, um, rather than over-raising it. Um, it, it, it. We shouldn't have to raise the taxes to pay for it. We have things like CRAs that suck up $30 million a year that if you did away with them and quit giving grants to businesses, then that money could be used for the things we really do need, like roads and infrastructure and our sheriff's department. Um, there are places like that that we have funds that we don't, we don't need to be meddling in. I mean, we don't, I don't think we need to be giving businesses grants. 
I had a business for years, and uh, nobody ever painted my front door for me, so I don't really feel inclined to do it for someone else. Um, and that, and then giving money to charities. I don't think that's the business of government. I think the first business of government is do with our money what we need to have done, and the um, extras like that, well, if you have a surplus, fine. But if you don't, you have to take care of the real needs first. And anyway, thank you for your time, and thank I'm you. sure you'll do the right thing. Barbara? Did she? Thank you. Mary Jane Nail? I'm sorry. That's why I usually do two at a time. And then after Mary Jane Robert, who's like right up front, so he doesn't even need warning. Sorry, Mary. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Please. Back again. You know, I love name? share. I'm sorry. Name and. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, I always forget that part. Okay. And I was an elected official. You'd think I would do better. Um, Mary Jane Nail, Cocoa Beach, Florida. Thank you. I love Sheriff Ivy. Doesn't he look great? He's on the keto diet. I, I, I spoke to him. I said, hey, why is it you're looking so good? He says, I'm losing weight. I've lost over 50 pounds. That's great because I want him to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Um, he's doing a great job. He and I love a lot of things together. We love animals. We love the First Amendment. We love the Second Amendment. I thought we loved low to no taxes, but I'm starting to wonder. Um, so I highly respect him. You know, he plays a great game of basketball, too, if y'all didn't know about that. And I want to recommend that he get stem cells instead of knee replacement. Just a little suggestion. Um, you know, here's the situation. Uh, let's pretend that this purse here is my family budget, okay? Okay, there's only a limited amount of money in this budget. And right now, there's just my husband and myself. So I want a walk-in tub. So I go to my husband and I say, hey, you know, I need a walk-in tub. And he says, that's great. Let's take a look at the budget. And let's just see where we can cut in order to get you that walk-in tub. Have you all ever thought of that novel idea? I want to recommend that you do that, that you think of where you can cut now, if you can't think of any ideas, I've got some ideas for you. How about selling some of the useless property that nobody's using, that the county owns and maintains and just keeps maintaining and owning and so on? You could do that. And there's probably a lot of other areas. When I supported candidates for county commission, they told me that they would always look where they could cut in order to spend. So I haven't heard any of this in your dialogue, none of it. Where, where, where are you going to cut? And when are you going to cut? And you know what? I want the cuts before you spend, because I don't really trust that you'll do that. Why don't I trust? I don't know, because you're going against what I voted for. I voted for a tax cap. And I think 73% of the population at that time voted for it. John Jr. Kennedy said, when asked if he became a, ran for president and became president, what's the first thing that you would do? And John Kennedy Jr. said, I do the same thing my dad did. I give the working men and women of America a tax cut. Thank you. Wow, you timed that right. That's pretty good. Okay, after Robert is Cheryl Lankis. Robert Burns, uh, Vieira, Florida. And I was, I, going to say most of what she just said. Um, uh, 
my concern is I, I support law enforcement fully. Most of my neighbors are law enforcement. My immediate neighbors are law enforcement. There's probably about 15 sheriff deputies that live in my subdivision. Um, but I also support fiscal responsibility. And what I don't see in this proposal is two things. I don't see cuts and I don't see a revenue statement of where these funds would actually be going. I see the request for needs, but or what is outlined as critical needs, but my question is what is a critical need? I think that may be something that is subjective. In my household, like Sheriff Ivy mentioned, we have wants and needs. Needs, in my opinion, are things that are required. If it's not a requirement, then it's, then it's a want. Um, so if it's not required, it couldn't be a need, let alone a critical need. But if we do have critical needs in my house, the first thing we have to do is get rid of things that we don't need uh, in order to be able to pay for those critical needs in order to support paying for them. Um, looking at the uh, Brevard County Sheriff's website this morning on the jobs site or the jobs tab, there is only one vacancy for a Brevard County Sheriff deputy. Um, so it's, it sounds like recruitment isn't too much of a problem. Uh, retention may be because of salary, but I don't know if salary, competitive salaries is a critical need. If that's a critical need, then I think across the street there's a couple thousand teachers that would argue that they're in a critical need for a salary increase. Um, I think that public safety is a direct correlation of education, and if we invest in our education as much as we invest in our law enforcement and other things, that, that will drive down our crime rates. It's, I live right next to Manatee Elementary, one of the best schools in the country, and it probably has the lowest crime rate in this county. However, where I grew up next to Stone Junior High School is one of the lower rated schools and one of the highest crime rates in this county. The need for increased population uh, in this area, I, uh, again, this is a low crime area, so I'm not sure how much we, more we need for that, but when I look at cuts, I looked at the sheriff's website also and the Facebook page and saw that we have a weekly cooking show that, in my opinion, seems to be a six to eight minute uh, commercial for local small businesses. And I don't know if those businesses are paying for it. I'm assuming that they're not and that that's actually a, a, tax paid, uh, a taxpayer funded commercial for small businesses with an endorsement by the sheriff's office and then about 20 seconds of a mugshot of somebody who they're trying to find. I think that if we charge those businesses at a minimum of $1,000, that's a great deal for being promoted on a Facebook page with $111,000. That's 52 commercials, that's $52,000 a year just from that. I think that takes care of some of the critical needs on this list. Thanks. Thanks. Cheryl, and after Cheryl, Matt and I. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Cheryl Lankus. I live in Merritt Island, and I'm truly humbled to come before you and speak about property taxes and budgets. As a Brevard County taxpayer that lives in an unincorporated area, the sheriff's huge budget impacts me and taxpayers like me most. I'm told about 11% more in MSTUs, which is code word for municipal service taxation unit. The Sheriff's Department resolution asks for you to vote yes to tax us more than our current law allows. No matter how you word it, exceeding rollback, adjusting MSTU, it's still an increase in the cash that comes out of my budget. Since 2008, when 73% of the voters voted, the county commissioners could only raise our taxes as much as the consumer price index or 3%, whichever is lower, our county has flourished. I might add, I don't think any of you won election by 73%, so that would be a number that I would want to honor. It's also used as a selling point for realtors, that um, tax cap. Requesting all the budget information available, it became clear to me that the resolution does not really define a critical need. No one should have to pay for a population increase that hasn't happened yet. 
Stating a rule of two sheriffs per thousand residents and forecasting out to 2025 does not make a critical need today. And when they get here, move here, they can pay taxes too. Um, especially since the sheriff's done such a great job of keeping crime oh, down, and I applaud him for that. I've never had to call the sheriff in the entire 30 years that I've lived here. Some of, the, some of our areas do have higher crime rates, but some also have lower rates, and manpower, I think, is allocated based on those trends. One critical need I do see, though, is better planning or stage, staggering of aging of hard assets. Sheriff's cars, tasers, and defibrillators shouldn't all be replaced at one time, but that's just my opinion. Um, I checked the salaries on the websites for Brevard County Sheriffs, for Volusia County Sheriffs, and Pasco County Sheriffs, because their counties are about the same size as ours, and they're similar in demographics. And we are comparable to those other counties. And we have a, a signing bonus for experienced officers, $3,000. When you factor that in, uh, we actually pay more. I want to talk about the schools really fast. We have 27 resource officers that the school board pays $52,000 a, a year for each one. And in the summer, they don't need them. So I don't think that's a critical lead either. So I think overturning the tax cap that voters overwhelmingly her, supported without thing. probable cause. What's going on with that clock? I know. Well, it's cl clicking up now. It didn't get started. So Dang that's why. it. Okay, I'm going to go back. Just wrap it up because it's my fault. Cause the I 20, okay, I'm just going to say the 2019-2020 budget does allocate extra money that was saved from other departments to the sheriff's department. So I feel like this is an internal problem that can be solved by the, the county working with the sheriff's department. And I would say overturning a tax cap that was overwhelmingly supported without probable cause did not, does not really serve the public. Okay, You're Cheryl. overruling the public. I think you've probably got your Thank three minutes. You. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for messing up the clock. It's like, I don't know, I feel like a DJ up here sometimes with all the equipment we have, and it's all new. So, Okay. After Matt and I, we have Bob White. Okay. So hello again. Matt and I from Suntree. Uh, earlier, I picked on a few of the commissioners, and I guess now I'm going to pick on the sheriff. Uh, I'm here to speak in opposition uh, to the critical needs request and breaking the millage cap. Uh, I want to begin by saying that by all objective measures, Sheriff Ivey has done a phenomenal job since being elected. His track record for endorsing conservative Republicans in state house primaries, not so hot, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> Uh, as the sheriff already mentioned, the data shows crime is down. The data I pulled from FDLE led me to calculate a 33% decrease from 2012 to 2018. So I think the sheriff is being conservative with the 29% figure, uh, but this is obviously something he should be very, very proud of, and rightly so. During that same time period, I went and pulled the head count for sworn law enforcement personnel, and that increased from 821, 821 in 2012 to 881 in 2018. That's a 7% increase in sworn personnel. The headcount for civilian personnel, however, which I assume are administrative support type positions, increased from 366 in 2012 to 480 in 2018. That's a 26 percent increase or more than three and a half times the rate of increase in sworn personnel. So I obviously admit I am not an expert in law enforcement, uh, but it would seem if you, are on a, you have a fixed amount of funding and sworn law enforcement officers are the priority you would slow the growth of the admin side to ensure that you have the funding you need for the sworn personnel. What I find most interesting about this whole conversation, though, is that according to the Florida Today story I just read, we're being at, you're being asked to break the charter millage cap uh, approved by 73% of voters back in 2008 because of what looked like about a roughly million dollar variance here like we're, we're it, it's a fraction of the 136 million dollar budget i came up with 0.7 percent based on the numbers that i saw uh in the florida today so sheriff ivy has blazed new trails by leveraging tv and social media with his cooking up justice and wheel of fugitive shows uh, so i'm hoping he can apply some create some of this creativity to his budget and get it to a place where he's not asking you to defy the will of the voters in summary i find it hard to believe that someone is talented 
competent and handsome as Sheriff Ivey can't find a way to cut less than a million dollars from the budget to avoid declaring a critical need. I know there are also questions about what the new baseline will be next year if this critical needs request is approved. Knowing the clerk as I do, I am fairly confident he will challenge the Scott Knox opinion stating this critical needs millage will be the new baseline uh, and he'll do that in court. This means the taxpayers will be footing the bill for that litis uh, litigation. Uh, I implore you to ask the sheriff to rework his budget or for you to cut in other areas. Uh, even without the critical needs assessment, the sheriff will get the largest budget ever proposed by uh, that office. And for the record, the only time I've ever, since we were talking about civility er earlier, the only time I've ever felt intimidated by the sheriff is when I was caught between him and the uh, dessert buffet at a political dinner. So thank you. <laughs> Yikes. Might want to have somebody walk you out. Wow. <laughs> Bob White, Sun Tree, Florida. And uh, I'd just like to say that um, the whole cooking up justice show thing, Wayne, um, you know, I saw you on one of those episodes you had on this big white ch uh, chef's thing and a big white chef's hat. And I was reminded of the movie Moby Dick, but that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother story. Wow. Um, <laughs> Civility, Mr. White. Civility, sorry, I, I apologize, I apologize. By whose gauge? Uh, no, in, in all seriousness, on behalf of the Republican Liberty Caucus, I would just like to say that we absolutely highly value and have nothing but the utmost respect for all of the men and women that serve with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. They do an outstanding job, they risk their lives on our behalf, and we absolutely appreciate them for what they do. And our Sheriff Wayne Ivey has been a highly effective and passionate advocate on their behalf and on behalf of his uh, on behalf of his department, as well he should be. Uh, he does a terrific job for us, as do all of his personnel. However, I am up here to speak against the resolution for a finding of critical needs, and it's not that I dispute any of the needs that he has put forward, or it's not that I'm trying to suggest that they're not legitimate. I'm not saying that at all. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that I agree 100% with the premise that Public safety is the number one priority of this board and of our county government. And right behind that comes infrastructure, no question about it. You get beyond public safety and infrastructure and priorities decline. The value, the, the relative value to the community from the other departments that are out there that are being funded by cover, county government, that value declines pretty rapidly in, in some cases. So I think it's incumbent upon you as county commissioners to find ways to fund those public safety needs, those legitimate needs that you identify working in conjunction with the sheriff by reducing the amount of money that you spend in other less valuable areas. In fact, we all know for a fact that you are funding some things that could not legitimately be described as an essential government function. Uh, that's, there's no question about that. There are things in your budget that simply do not meet that definition of being a legitimate government function. So get rid of all of that. Uh, apply your, your, uh, you know, your critical scalpel to some of those other less valuable areas that are within the budget and come up with what you need to fund those needs. And maybe, maybe some of these needs, as critical as they are, could be, in fact, acquired over a two or a three or an even longer period of time to get to where you ultimately need to be. So please don't do anything that would bust that cap that was voted on by 73% of the people. Uh, don't ignore the will of the people in that fashion when there are other opportunities that you have to meet the needs that are legitimate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ralph Perone, Sr. And after Ralph, Charles Tovey. Well, wow, Commissioners, I'm, I'm not nearly as good a speaker as some of the people that have been up here already. But Who are you? Ralph Perone, Sr. I'm a local businessman. I live at 2398 Newfound Harbor Drive, Merritt Island. I know who you are. I wasn't trying to be rude. I just I didn't want to. For the record. For the record. Yes, Thank you. Go ahead. And uh, my businesses are in Rockledge, Cocoa, Merritt Island, and we've now expanded into Cape Canaveral. Um, I'm here to speak as a citizen of Brevard County. Um, I and paying approximately right now about $220,000 a year in property taxes. So this would affect me, uh, I would suspect, quite a bit. But I am here 150% to support Sheriff Ivey's request. Could you imagine going to a, a call and a deputy gets charged by a suspect or he's got to pull his taser out because someone's beating up someone and his taser doesn't fire? 
Or how about if he's going lights and sirens to a call to save someone's life and it's one of your loved ones and the car breaks down? These are real things that can actually happen. Commissioners, if, you know, I, I wrote all this down and, and it's just too hard for me to read it, but the, in my world, you, if you go out and do a ride along and spend a week, not two hours, not four hours, but a week with a Brevard County Sheriff deputy or any other law enforcement, COCO, wherever it may be, you'll have a great understanding of what these people do and how they put their lives on the line every single day. If you look behind you, there's approximately 11 green uniforms behind you. If a criminal comes through that door, there's not a one of them that won't pull their gun out and do what they have to do to put their lives on the line to protect everyone in this room. I'm sorry, but if I have to pay a little bit more in taxes, it's not that important to me for my family, my kids, my grandkids, and our life and safety, and as well as in our school system, having the, the school resource officers there. That's far more important. I didn't realize it was even that small. I own homes and multiple buildings, and I'm willing to pay it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tovey. Thank you. Charles Tovey, 2555 Roberts Road. And I was offered 10 minutes to speak one time, and if I thought that was enough time, I would have went ahead and taken care of it. The budget. Well, there's 11 deputies in the room right now, and I'm wondering if they're on the clock. That's a good start right there, where the money's going and how it's being spent. I don't have nothing to lose against it at all. And I have family members that are law enforcement and had my great-great-granddad was sheriff of Titus of Brevard at one time. A few years ago, and it had to have been after the 2009, Stockton Witten put up his pie chart, and a deputy was here, or the sheriff was here for a raise then, and a major proportion of Brevard spending was the sheriff's office. If the crime's going down, why do we need more money? Well, and the other thing is, thank you for, I have no rights. They burn my house down, they shoot at me, they beat on me, they attack me every day, whether it's from anonymous phone calls or not. Tell me I'm not allowed to sit on the sidewalk and I can't do this and I can't do that. And not, not nobody in the past, let's see, from 2009, 10 years has spoke up against any of the wrongdoings and with their uh, perspective, it, it, there will be no wrongdoing done. And I'll say that for another time. And I don't have any problem against the deputies or the sheriff, but it's the lack of not doing anything for me, my life, liberty, and no. It's all gone, and this is the best thing I can think of to do in my life besides pray to God and be true to him as best I can. Well, they burnt down my house. Who did it? My neighbor did it. Destroyed everything I had, and then the mayor comes along and puts code enforcement on everything. So now I'm stacked past my lifetime and several lifetimes of, of sanctions and things all because of why? I never put a no trespassing on the person taking my plants or none of it. No investigation, no nothing. I do have a problem and as soon as I get the time and the voice one way or the other, I will explain it all. And I do have witnesses, I do have proof physical proof, I have videos, it's just unbelievable, and no one's going to do anything. That makes these people just as bad as the rest of them, because they all know the malfeasance and the things that go along, and it's okay. We're well, going to turn the other cheek, uh, selective enforcement. Thank you. All right, I just got another card, Pam Sal.
Hi, Pamela Hi. Sal Vieira. I'll try not to repeat. So many people have made valid points already, but there's a couple of, is, can you hear me? It doesn't sound right to me. It's on. Okay. Okay. Um, anyway, um, a point that wasn't really um, hit home that much are the SROs in the schools come out of the school budget. I don't see why they're coming out of the sheriff's budget that gets billed to the county because there's um, a clause with the school board that uh, the sheriff is to be compensated for the SRs for salary benefits and associated costs. So that's everything else, it's a big umbrella. So the county shouldn't pay for that twice or the taxpayer shouldn't pay for that twice. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is during Sheriff Ivey's tenure, senior citizens' COLA increases have averaged 1.43%. Social Security is not usually that big of a check anyway, but a lot of people have to live on that. We need y'all to hold the line on the tax cap. If y'all want to give the sheriff a 5% raise every year for three years, to pay the deputies 5% raises, that's fine. But find the money within the budget you have. Don't come to us busting the tax cap to do it. One point I'd also like to make before I leave, sitting here and listening to your discussion, why do any of us even come up here and speak? Because all of you, well, four of you <laughs> maybe, have voiced your opinions about how you're gonna be voting on this issue. Um, you know, it, it would be a step towards civility and respect if you would at least pretend to value what we have to say. Thank you. All right. I have no more cards. Commissioner Lober? I have some thoughts. Uh, I just want to address some of the things that came up in no particular order. Um, one of the first speakers mentioned that 73%, I think it was, of the voters approved the tax cap. I believe it's also true that those very same voters also approved in that exact same vote a supermajority of the commission being able to find a critical need and being able to exceed it. Um, so there's nothing remotely unlawful or not in keeping of what the voters intended. They certainly had that text on the actual vote that they went ahead and approved. So we're not overturning a tax cap. We're operating within the framework that was approved by 73% of the voters. Uh, Ms. Schumer mentioned that CRAs are, are an area where we can cut. I agree. Um, I'll just put this out there for the, the second meeting in a row. If someone <clears throat> wants to put Palm Bay's CRA on the chopping block, uh, I can tell you where I'm going to be with that. They're going to get nuked. Uh, there are a couple other CRAs where I may put them on the chopping block, one of which I believe is progressing with Mr. Abate on the discussions regarding an interlocal, but if they don't pan out, uh, I'll be putting one or two up myself. Uh, as far as grants to businesses that were mentioned, I will tell you that Myra in particular has done some things that I am very uh, displeased with, with respect to giving business grants, and I'm in the process of determining whether or not they're going to do what needs to be done to clean that process up, and if they don't, they I believe they've actually read a uh, proposal, I think I sent it to them, basically saying this is what I'll be doing to go over your head to ensure that we do what we need to so that we're not essentially giving away money with no ROI. I support them, but I support them in a way that generates an ROI. And what, what they did in the recent past, I've not been pleased with, uh, insofar as business grants are concerned. Uh, I want to focus on the fact as well that there's a reason we're not advertising a proposed tax increase, because by the actual real legal definition, we're not increasing taxes. There's a reason that, that you would ordinarily have to advertise a tax increase, and it's not happening here. I don't think there's anything wrong with the county government or any business reprioritizing where they spend the money so, to focus on, so as to focus on those core obligations, as, as Mr. White had mentioned. Um, I will say, and I'm going to try to say it in the nicest possible way in the interest of civility, that uh, one speaker who, in, uh, who had mentioned that there was only one deputy position on BCSO's website, I went ahead and pulled it up while I was sitting here. I can tell you there's one spot for deputies to apply, but if you look at it, there's nothing that says there's one spot open. There's also one spot for a variety of other positions, which incidentally mean, means that you can apply regardless. It's, it, they're not 50 different categorizations of deputy, and in looking at that, it seemed readily apparent to me. So I'll leave it at that to be nice. 
Uh, as, far as, as far as overturning the cap, I've addressed that. We're certainly not exceeding rollback. I think there was one speaker that may have suggested that. Uh, I did hear from Mr. Nye, I think, that his numbers regarding crime being down were even greater than 29%, and also Mr. Tovey had mentioned that. Um, with the crime having gone down, why more money? I'm going to answer that real simply. I don't want to punish the sheriff for being efficient. To suggest that crime going down is a reason not to increase would simply incentivize him not to do his job. Uh, one of my first jobs that I had when I was, when I was in college, I was, it was a great cubicle job, almost like the movie The Office, where I had the little masking tape and put my name on my stapler so it didn't walk off. Lovely. Be that as it may, um, I got my hours cut. And I, I said to my boss at the time, am I getting a raise? And she said, well, why would you get a raise? I said, well, why are my hours being cut? And she said, well, you don't need to work eight hours to do what I've set out for you to do. You've illustrated that you don't need that much time. I said, so you're, you're telling me that you're going to punish me for being efficient and making good use of my time. I left that job. Um, and I guarantee you they paid someone to sit there for a full eight hours who wasn't trying to be as, as efficient as I was. Uh, Mr. Perone had mentioned you know, the possibility of a taser not working in a, in a um, domestic violence situation. Uh, I'm going to take that one step further. If it doesn't fire, guess what they may have to resort to? They may have to shoot someone and kill them. So I very much am concerned that we give them the non-lethal options that they need so we don't end up having to kill people. Um, as far as the cooking up justice, you know, the, the same folks that would be critical of that, I, I truly do wonder if they would be critical if the sheriff didn't do community outreach. It just seems that whether he walks to the left or walks to the right, there's some folks that will be displeased regardless. Um, beyond that, you know, I, I certainly respect public opinion, and as to Ms. LaSalle's comment that we should pretend to care, I do care, but I've had so many people contact me in advance of this meeting, and I've been briefed to such an extent by Frank and by Jill. Truth be told, there was very little additional content that I've heard here that I hadn't heard prior to this meeting. Had someone come up with something novel or unique, it absolutely could have swayed where I was. You know, it's not in stone. I didn't sign in blood or take an oath that I was going to support this. And if someone had a compelling reason not to do that, I I'm telling you right now, I wouldn't have. Uh, but where I, where I was when I started, I'm essentially at the same spot. So I'm not going to take any more time. I see we have a couple other folks that, that have their lights on. Commissioner Pritchett. Yeah, I'll go quickly because we've had a six-hour commission meeting so far. Ms. LaSalle. Still not done. I know. Um, I like you. Um, the reason I throw that out early is so that people have a chance to change my mind. So that, that's why I do that. But I do listen very intently to what you have to say, you especially, to what you have to say, ma'am, and what, what everybody has to say as far as this. A couple of uh, thoughts. you got to understand, I, I don't believe anybody up here is, is um, actually, I think they're all really tight. I've been with them for a while, and, and everybody's been very tight on the budget in the past years. 2010 to 2016, so let me just rehearse this real quick. We went through a huge economic crisis. Property values dropped. We lost a lot of money on the county level and on the city levels. Incredible taxes. Those years were cut, 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 cut. I'm not even sure that we've reestablished staff levels to where we were in 2009. And we guys, we all remember that crisis. 2016 to 18, we've stabilized. We still didn't increase. We actually got stabilized on a budget. We were able to add some, some staff back. Property values went up. We are still stable this year in the budget. Actually, if you take the consideration of what we're having to do with the supervisor of election and the other constituent office, we're probably doing some more cuts this year in the general fund. So here's the thing. We have a sheriff that needs extra funding at this time, the same as the supervisor of elections, the same as the clerk of courts. They need these items. The cool thing is, is we have an MSTU that we can apply it to the, there directly, and, and I, I understand it's over that amount, but please understand if you have a $100,000 home and you live here homestead, $2.50 a year. I mean, it's minimal compared to the service we're getting here. And he is, he's pretty frugal with his items. And I don't know about the cooking show and all that. And from what I heard, he can't cook anyways. But he eats. But he, uh, I don't know, he's actually been looking pretty dapper here lately. <laughs> But all that to say is, is that I, I believe this is a critical need for the sheriff's department. I really do, or, or we, wouldn't be, we, haven't, we wouldn't be doing this. And I don't think there's any more money to take out of the general fund. And we've talked about some things everybody thinks not necessarily should be there. But we have made a decision that we are weaning those things off. And again, I think the CBOs, this is their last year even on the budget if they're on it this year. So this has been a very responsible commission moving forward. So I, I just want to say I believe this is a critical need. I'm glad it is going in, into this so you see exactly where your tax dollar is going. It's not coming to us to make decisions. It's going straight to the 
Sheriff's Department for, for Public Safety. And I, um, I didn't hear anything that changed my mind on that so far because the accounting aspect of this, this makes sense. Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't think this is purposely made complicated, but it is a little bit complicated. So yeah. let me explain it as best as, as I understand it. The sheriff's budget is going up, and yet there are going to be no tax increases. And on top of that, we have, uh, Mr. Bate hasn't mentioned this, but we will actually have more money uh, for roads. There, in the budget, there are 62 miles as opposed to a few miles less than last year. So how, how do we accomplish, you know, sheriff getting more money, uh, no tax increases, and then uh, prioritizing roads? And there's two reasons that I've come up with. Number one, and I think this is the most important one, uh, we have a frugal, very, very frugal, uh, County Manager Frank Abate has, you know, I'd hate to be in those meetings with the department heads, um, but he's done some uh, great work there. And Jill Hayes uh, tirelessly works to make this uh, all come all come to fruition. The second reason is this budget is larger than last year's, um, even though the. Uh, millage rate is is the same. Property values have gone up, so we're more than ten million dollars uh, of of money that we had last year. On top of that, we have new construction, so we're getting by this time. What I'm worried about is some things that you've probably heard come up here: is that the sheriff still has uh, future needs, future critical needs, and that may not be balanced off with this new revenue. This all economies are cyclical. Uh, the, the, the wonderful economist up there in, in Tallahassee who works for the legislature, Amy Baker, says um, we're going to see a dip here in the next 18 to 24 months. So we're, we're, we, we're, we're going to have this perfect storm coming up with the sheriff needing uh, more resor resources uh, and, and less funds. So that gives us one of two decisions to make potentially as soon as next year. And the first decision, and I've heard many um, of my fellow uh, commissioners here are against this, is increasing taxes. Um, I'll tell you right now, um, I'm sorry, Ms. LaSalle, uh, no matter what anyone says up here, I'm not going to vote to raise your taxes. Uh, that's uh, off the table. I will, not, I, I will not be doing that. You're going to find out I'm not even willing to bust the cap here in a minute. But uh, So the second part is we're going to have to make cuts, which this board generally doesn't do. Uh, we, 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 from large cuts uh, of CRAs to small cuts, I mean, little cuts, these things add up. Last time we had a historical commission uh, that doesn't know what year Brevard County became a county, and that little uh, uh, financer would have been about 1300 bucks. I know $1,300 is not a lot of money, but it's $1,300 more than we have today that comes out of general fund. If we were to cut $1,300 per meeting, we would be a heck of a lot better than the, the, the situation we're currently in. So um, the challenge I'm going to make uh, to this commission as we move forward is the writing's on the wall. Uh, new construction cannot last forever. The sheriff has been extremely honest, saying, hey, we're busting at the seams. We're going to have more needs, whether uh, we get the opinion back as to whether or not the new baseline is going to be uh, at, at the current rate with, with, the, with the, um, the millage or, or the MSTU or whether it's rolled back, we're going to face some challenges. So uh, I, I certainly have been brought forward numerous cuts and they've gone down, you know, many times without a second. I encourage uh, the rest of the commission up here, so we're not in the same position. I mean, I would ideally like to be able to fund uh, the sheriff in the general fund where he wouldn't have to come up here and say, hey, guys, this is a critical need because we have those funds. So uh, I certainly ask that between now and next year, we take a tough look at the budget and say, maybe this doesn't belong here. And, you know, to get the ball rolling, uh, the BCA, uh, in the budget has $70,000 that could otherwise go to fulfill 
Sheriff Ivey's special, uh, I almost said special need, I apologize, critical need uh, for 2021. So uh, I will be voting against this one um, uh, and I respect the work uh, of the sheriff and all that his deputies do, but I think that we need to sharpen our pencils a little bit more and make sure we don't put, that sh we don't put the sheriff in that tough position again. Okay, I'm just gonna say, and I'll just make a couple of points. You know, I, I just, I find it interesting that oftentimes we don't have intelligent conversations that very, gets very political. And while, you know, whether this be an ad valorem tax, whether this be a user fee on your property tax bill, whether this be a solid waste fee, for instance, that Commissioner Tobiah has been okay with raising in the past to include the Melbourne Tillman, user fee on our pro that sits on our property tax bill. Apparently, solid waste fees and Melbourne Tillman fees are okay to raise, but we can't raise fees for law enforcement. However, you know, unfortunately, this is something that we need because it's a service that protects our residents. Whether you agree with the sheriff having a cooking show and, and, and having a wheel of fugitive and whether you think that that's right, it does return results. I would much rather uh, the sheriff spend 10 minutes on a, on behind a video camera, then send four deputies out trying to locate somebody who's, who's a dangerous criminal or maybe a semi-dangerous criminal who's violated probation or who's harassing somebody that they've got a warrant out for their arrest. So I would much rather social media be used as a platform and people view our law enforcement sometimes as having fun cooking at a business, as somebody that's approachable as opposed to this very intimidating thing. We see videos of, of the once in a while um, law enforcement officer that doesn't do the right thing because those tend to go more viral than the fun ones of, of Sheriff Ivy playing around in his car chasing down <laughs> old people and doing all kinds of, but it, it it's actually makes you look more human. So I can appreciate that. And those are the videos that don't get shared. And But anyway, I, I'm kind of going off sideways here. But, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm not... We can argue about who's more conservative. We can argue about, I'm never going to vote to raise your taxes, but I'm okay with raising your fees and, 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 and raising your solid waste rates. So I just, I think it's kind of disingenuous to say such a thing. And, and when you use things that, when you, when you quoted in the newspaper as saying that we're paying for lighthouses, when knowing full well that the lighthouse that was pay, passed by the commission couldn't have been used out of our regular general fund. It's TDC money, it's not even the same thing. So I, I'm, I'm gonna call it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion passes 4-1. Oh. Yes. Um, excuse me, I noticed a Scrivener's error in the resolution. May I have permission to correct that? Oh, it's a reference to a subparagraph B. Okay. Okay. Okay, do we have a motion? So. Motion. Okay. Second. <laughs> okay, motion by Commissioner Pritchett, second by Commissioner Lober, <laughs> and that's with the permission to correct the Scrivener's error? Yes. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Are you voting, Commissioner Tobias? Aye. Okay. You're voting for it? For correction of the Scrivener's error. Okay. Well, there wasn't a motion for the resolution. To make a motion. Yeah, so I could have. That, that was for the Scribner's error. Mm -hmm. That's what I understood. No, no, it wasn't. But there was no motion on the floor for the thing. I don't think there so, was. Yeah. So I could have actually made you vote for it. You just accidentally <laughs> voted yeah. for it. I thought there was a motion. I what did I vote nay on? Are we in a good spot where we've, we've approved the resolution? I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should do one more just to be perfectly yes. clear in the vote caution. I voted nay on the resolution extremely loudly. <laughs> yeah, there's no question. I'm not sure there was a motion. Okay, before. for clarity, because I think everybody's a little tired. I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll move again to okay. approve the resolution. With the correction. With the okay. Actually, uh, it was Commissioner Pritchett that made the motion and you that seconded it with the correction of the Scrivener's error. Yes, this is for clarity. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion passes 4-1. For the Scrivener's error. <sighs> All right. Are we good? Yes. Oh, Lord. Okay. Item J6. Oh. You know, in an abundance of uh, 
of respect for folks' time. I know there are some folks that have public comment. What I'm going to do, if it's all right, is I'll just allow public comment since they were patient enough to sit here, and then I'll continue it from that point to a subsequent meeting. So we're going to have to take a break soon because I think I need to eat something. And yeah, I just I think we all probably need. That's yeah. kind of what I'm thinking. I, I don't want to keep people here too much okay. longer, but they, they did wait so long. Mr. Sanson, we'll discuss later. I got a card for you. We're 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 going to table this item so you can come up and comment because you're here, if you'd like. Yeah, I just I didn't want to cut you all off and not give you the opportunity since you've been here for what six hours it looks like. Yes, sir. I have the, the good fortune to have, be here at the beginning and at the end. Have so you had fun, sir? How it goes. Oh, have yeah. you enjoyed the things in between? <laughs> this is the question. Madam Chairman Jerry Sansom, uh, Chairman of the Tysville Cocoa Airport Authority, and I live in Cocoa. Um, I'm in a, I'm a practitioner of government, so like you guys, uh, we do what we have to do to to get go, to get good government done. And um, I think we that the our body, and like I said, I have no idea what the conversation here today is is going to be about. So that's why I was just going to sit and then I put in a card just for convenience, so that after you got through, I wasn't out here waving my head my hand, just trying to get your attention, but. Uh, Mr. Powell, our CEO, is here. Um, again, we saw y'all. We saw that we were on the agenda, so we thought we should be here uh, to answer any questions you may have or fill in any details that you would want about our operation. Uh, I was glad to note that for the 13th consecutive year, we are not in your budget as an ad valorem item to compete with with uh, libraries and dog pounds. And, all of those kinds of things, we try to run on our, run ourselves very self-sufficient. Um, and with that, and the item that I saw you have is, we do have one at-large position coming up in August. Um, I would hope that you would reappoint Dr. Dave Hosley. He's a very valuable asset to us. He's been a very good board member. Uh, he's here today in case you've got any questions. Uh, I think. The three of y'all that vote on that item have had an opportunity to talk to Dr. Hosley, but again, he's a very valuable member of our board. Um, and if you've got any questions about our board, uh, I'll be glad to try to answer them today. Um, I can tell you if I'm in town, I'll be here when you do talk about the item. Um, and with that, Madam Chairman, I'll be glad to quit. Unless you, like I said, if you got any technical questions about how we operate or what we're doing, any decisions we made or whatever, I'll try to answer them as chairman, or if it's more technical than that, uh, our CEO, uh, Mr. Powell, is here to handle those. We didn't want you guys operating in a vacuum or lack of information about what we do and how we do it. And Thank we you. do try very hard to stay off of your radar uh, as a good government entity, and uh, we do the best we can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any more cards? No. Okay, I'd move to, to continue this and have it tabled until the next meeting, next regular meeting. Second. Motion by Commissioner Lober to table to. To table this particular when? item to the, uh, what's our next regular meeting? August. August 6th. To August 6th. August 6th. A second by Commissioner Pritchett. Yes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right, moving on to public comment. I don't see Pete Fuskus here anymore. No, I think he left. I'm going to keep a little bow tie on. I know. I'll tell you yeah. this right, right up front. Matt Fleming? He's left too. It looks going like once. He's gone. Janice Crisp? How many cards do we have today? You guys are troopers. Everybody that's, that's hanging out this long. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Janice Crisp. I'm from um, Palm Bay. Um, I just wanted to start by saying um, there were some things said here today that I hope that I'd like to clear up. Um, Mr. Lober was accused of threatening someone's job, um, and there was issues talked about that were said offline about speaking badly to a woman. I would just like people to know, and I hope this, I really do hope this ends this, this issue started a long, long before that. Um, and the lady, and I'm not going to mention, mention her name because I think everybody knows who that is by now, um, 
started by attacking Mr. Lober online while he was at um, a Habitat for Humanity event that he was asked for so that this Habitat for Humanity could receive $100,000 for uh, homeless or um, women's veterans. Um, he was specifically asked to be there. Um, and I know that there were many, many volunteers there that helped make this happen. But this lady attacked him after seeing him there, took a picture, posted it online, and her words were, yep, that's the hypocrite who showed up at Habitat Shovel Ceremony acting like he actually gives a SHIT about our project. That's the comment that started it all. And I'm not going to go through it all, but later on, she said um, in the same feed, here's my hope that you will prove us all wrong, magically become a kind, wait, let me back up. I will apologize for my pro profanity, even though I get to the point only after extreme frustration when the good people of this county are not, have not elected are not elected and people like you, referring to Mr. Lober, simp are simply because of tribalism and unfortunate demographics. So here's my hope, that you will prove us all wrong and magically become a kind and honest and generous person. I'm going to try now to be kind to you going forward, but please know that again, it's because of people like Mel, Jake, and Alex, but idle threats to my employer that I do so. Peace out. So then she brought it to the council here. She's the one who brought it to the council and made up this big deal about threats that she considered idle. So it wasn't really a threat to her. But she's the one who said it's tribalism and that it was Mr. Lober's election that she was frustrated. So that's why we've, in, we've had to deal with this for months and months and months. So I wanted the record to be clear. Thank you very much. You can talk when everybody's done. Janice Crisp. That's me. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez, late in the hour, I apologize. Karen Colby. And after Karen, Judy Kuhn. And after Judy, Melissa Martin. Hi. Karen Colby, um, Indian Harbor Beach. I just wanted to wrap up a couple of things and to thank you guys for the time you spent for our county today and two weeks ago. That's a good 11 hours and we've been here with you. We appreciate every one of you, even though, I mean, we might have all had a disagreement at the beginning, but I think that the county has come together better. I haven't heard any profanity coming from the audience. There was no organized coughing. This has been a nice experience compared to last time. I've never felt scared to come here. I never had a voice until I started, well, when I was, became a mom. Then I felt like I could talk about anything. You didn't hit the button. Oh. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. That wasn't on purpose. <laughs> I'm a mom. So I wanted to, first of all, about the Mr. Lower thing. Um, I was involved with the posts. Um, I got upset when I saw one that mentioned something having to do with two white men um, being the final people on a docket for the Democratic Party. That pushed me over the edge. And when that was shared in a post that was the discussion that went on and on and on, um, ending in the snowplow and the Ford F-150 comment that he got blamed for, he didn't do any of that. Um, it was all caused at the beginning by the two white men statement. That was just what put me over the edge. I don't think that's funny. I don't think it's fair. I don't think that anybody should talk like that and then come up and say, we have to all moderate what we say because of what I say matters, but what you say doesn't. I mean, that's the way I took it. Anytime you have a comment with any penny that you don't agree with, they throw insults at you. I appreciate the fact that nobody insulted anybody today much. It was nice. I do have two things that I heard. One had to do with a snow plow and all that, okay. That had to do with a woman that made a comment about, sure, you're going to watch out for the chargers or something like that. Well, that had to do with Sheriff Ivy's cars. If any of the Antifa people come here, I'm not scared. We got Sheriff Ivy and he's got chargers. That would be those souped up four doors. A two door is a challenger. I would know this intimately. I know my cars. Um, so, uh, and I've been pulled over by one of his chargers. <laughs> and I didn't get a ticket, I got a warning. Um, so that's why the charges were mentioned. And then when I, I'm the one that said, if you miss 
that miss one with the snow plow back up and do it again. That was splashing, splashing. I'm a mom of six. I will lob a water balloon at anybody. I will splash anybody. No harm, no foul. And when I saw that the trouble was coming and that there was, I'm going to say, not very intelligent people making nasty comments, I pulled my post. That pulled his. He didn't pull that post to hide. I pulled it. I pulled it because people lost their minds. Okay, I just wanted to make that clear that Mr. Lober never pulled any post to hide. I did it. By moving me, I moved him. Okay, thank y'all, and thanks for everything. Thank you. Bye. Judy Kuhn. Yes, thank you, Commission. Um, my name is Judy Kuhn. I live in Cocoa Beach. And um, I need to address, again, the First Amendment issues in the civility ordinance. Um, one of the important goals of what we were doing here was to educate the people about First Amendment rights and standards and the different standards that there are for public speech and for elected official speech. That was one of the goals. Unfortunately, that goal was not met at all. Uh, there was massive confusion and um, I will say that Commissioner Lober made misleading comments about the standards in his line of inquiry to the county attorney. He cited cases that did not deal with elected official speech. He cited cases that dealt with public members of the public wearing um, uh, jackets with profane statements on them and those sorts of things. He, uh, unfortunately, the public has come away with this thinking that we all have the same public First Amendment right. It is not true. You all, please, are held to a higher standard. And, you, and there is a link between the speech that you make here on the dais, in social media, and the uptick in violence that is happening across the United States. So please, um, people are afraid to come before you. They're afraid for their jobs. They're afraid for their reputations. They're afraid for, to be humiliated. And to recognize that your standards, you are held to a much greater standard. And that the trust of the public rests on you. You are models. Okay. We come up here, and I think everyone has pretty well behaved themselves today, except for Commissioner Lober and some of his, his statements. But please do not, if, this were, if you had come into a court of law making those sorts of statements, you would have been censured. You, the judge would never have allowed um, Ninth Circuit cases that dealt with private speech to be used in an elected official's situation. So I really object to that and hope that... that this differential standard is completely understood by both members of the, of the county commission as well as members of the public. There is no equivalence here. Thank you very much. Melissa Martin. Melissa Martin, Coco. Thank you. Um, on behalf of everyone involved with this beautiful process of figuring out who we are and what we're about. Um, and I appreciate your deliberate thought and your endurance through the whole thing and um, the level of professionalism that we could, that we could have in this uh, very awkward subject matter. Um, not, I'll dovetail off of Ms. Kuhn's uh, comments because that is the crux of this issue. I think there is a continuing confusion, point of confusion regarding what the law actually says. And I hope that um, instead of going forth with any other, you know, measures or policy statements or ordinances or anything like that, I think it would be beautiful if we could simply go back to something that was uh, suggested along the way um, to request a legal opinion from Ms. Bentley about the First Amendment rights, um, the legal and ethical duties of elected officials, where that meets with the public's rights to speech and expectations of our public officials in and outside of commission chambers. I think that once that is clarified for all concerned, a lot of our problems will fall away. Thank you.
Thank you. I just got one more card, uh, Sanjay Patel. Sanjay Patel from Satellite Beach. I think it's really important to make sure that the facts are brought forth. Uh, we had two individuals just say something. So for the record, I want to set something straight. This is in regards to Commissioner Lober's snowplow comments. The original verbiage, the first comment said, word of wisdom to the protesters, beware of the Dodge Chargers. The next comment, which came from the individual sitting behind me, if you hit one, back up and go again. Just kidding. It is to that comment which Commissioner Lover replies, I wouldn't recommend using a snowplow. It might look intentional. So anyone who would read a thread like that, a couple questions because Commissioner Lover has said he thought it referred to law enforcement. So did the individuals in the audience. When has law enforcement, if you hit one back up and go again, are we, did they mean these deputies were going to hit the protesters with their car? The next comment, if you hit one back up and go again, you then said, I wouldn't recommend using the snow plow. It might look intentional. Commissioner Lover, what might look intentional? Hitting someone with the snow plow? To everyone in this room, it's extremely it's extremely clear what we're talking about, and we are not going to stand by while folks try to back themselves out of it. It's just completely deceitful and dishonest. Own your comments. What you said is very clear. So I just wanted to make that clear for the record. Thank you. OK. Commissioner Lober, I'm going to let you speak, but I'm just going to caution you just as a colleague. I've been chomping at the bit. Well, just realize what's, what's productive dialogue. But I understand. Again, but I, I'm not going to tell you you can't say what you want to say, but I'm just going to. Nor would I ever to any of the folks sitting here or even the folks there. Caution. So I, I kind of want to go through here. Mm -hmm. It's time to be done. Right. It, it is, but unfortunately, well, if you need to go, Mr. Smith, then you need to go. We have an executive session, too. But I, I think that too. everyone has an entitlement to respond to folks that are making false allegations, unless you don't agree with that. I'm sure you're not going to say anything we haven't heard from you before. I don't know. You, you, we know what you're going to say. I mean, well, we're, we're you're going to disavow Smith. what they say. You're going to say what you mean and meant, and what they said doesn't mean what you meant. And so no. we're, we're in the same place that we were before. Not necessarily. OK. You think it's going to be productive, that what you're going to say is going to be productive, or it's just going to make you feel better? I would certainly afford you the same opportunity to say something in response if something was said incorrectly about you. And I wouldn't criticize well, you for trying to do it. And I would expect you to because I haven't taken up hours and hours and hours of your time with those kind of comments. So I would hope that you well, would you give me one, to the one, oppor one opportunity to say something. But I just don't agree that you should take time out from our day because you have a personal problem with what you said and how you said it and how it's been I don't have a personal problem with anything I've said. I have a personal problem with folks saying something that's defamatory or untrue. Okay. okay. No, you can't speak from the audience. No, the public comments are closed. Public comments are closed. Mr. Lober? All right. I would just ask that in the interest of time, you just keep it short. Oh, I've tried to keep it short. I'm, I'm going to fly through it. So uh, with respect to the quote that Ms. Crisp had read, I, I do believe, and I may be incorrect after a six and a half hour meeting, that there was actually even worse profanity that was edited out. So I don't know if your copy had the word edited, but my recollection, though I may be wrong, is that there was even worse language in there. Um, with respect to the other point is I never ever reached out to that person's employer. She lied about who employed her. Any contention to the contrary is simply inadequate. We had that person come up and lie standing at the podium uh, as we had Ms. Martin actually confirm, interestingly enough, when she was here last time. As far as the snowplow comment, I heard from Mr. Patel, interestingly, that he can apparently read my mind and tell me which comment I was replying to. I don't know how often you've used Facebook, sir, but when you click reply, it generally puts that person's name in blue. Now, Ms. Colby's name wasn't in blue because I wasn't replying to her comment. Now, I know that you can ascribe ill motives to other individuals just because they're on the other side of the fence, and I respect your right to do that, but you're dead incorrect. Um, Moving on, Ms. Coons, I believe the last time she came up here, she was threatening to sue the county with respect to the Diamond Square CRA. Ma'am, I'm okay. not speaking. You had your three minutes. 
you okay. had your three minutes. So she, she came up here saying she was going to educate people on First Amendment rights. That's absolutely laughable. Now, regarding misleading statements to Ms. Bentley, um, is anything that I asked you in any way misleading? And if so, I'll give you ample opportunity to, to suggest whatever may have been added to in terms of context or to, to uh, correct anything that I may have misstated. Um, you asked whether or not certain cases had certain language in them. They did have that language in them. However, those cases dealt with the ejectment of people from meetings and the false arrest of individuals. So they were not comparable situations to the proposed ordinance and that the censure Sir. that was discussed was um, within the board parameters of who would be chair and letter to the governor. So they were very different situations and I think that's what she meant about misleading. But that's case law. Right, and again, we're, we're obviously, we're obligated to deal with only those items in which there exists case law, given that everything is a novel um, compilation of facts. Would you not agree that those cases are certainly relevant as to the propositions that I brought them up for? Well, they were First Amendment cases, but they were not on all fours because they dealt with ejectment of the public from a meeting. And we were dealing with board members and a board policy, which there is case law saying that you can have content neutral board procedural rules. Right, and I, I don't believe I've ever suggested otherwise. I okay. simply suggested that the application of those rules might be problematic. Now, in terms of um, another item that she suggested that in the middle district, I believe, or she said in the local courts, which in this case would be the middle districts, that a judge would never allow me to use any of the court cases I cited. Is that correct? That I'd be censured for that? I can't answer that one. <laughs> Well, it wouldn't have been county business had it not been brought up. Um, I'll leave it be. You know what? We wasted enough time on this. You know, if, I, I don't know what, what I won't stand for it means, but you've had every strike at the apple, and you've not accomplished anything other than having wasted our time, sir. So if you want to continue to waste taxpayer dollars, come back and do the same thing again. Otherwise, let's get back to county business. Okay. Item L, board reports, Mr. Vate. Tell me something happy and good. No report. Oh, happy and good. I guess, depending on your interpretation of that. Ms. Bentley? No report. I'll see you at the executive session. That's not happy. In other words, don't forget. <laughs> Commissioner Pritchett? No report. Commissioner Lober? Nothing. Commissioner Tobia? I thought Commissioner Pritchett was going to handle this one for me because she could do it so much better. Um, I hope going forward, whether it be in this boardroom or whether it be once we leave, that we can just be nicer to one another. That's all I'm hoping for, that um, we don't get into this tit for tat, because I think you know the, the losers are everyone in those type of situations, to have hurt feelings. The, the fact that we may disagree on on policy doesn't make the other person bad one way or another. And sometimes, you know, I, I'm the last person ever to quote the Bible, but sometimes you just need to turn both sides. You just need to turn the other cheek and say, let's move on. That sometimes makes the other person more mad is when, when you kill them with kindness. And guys, I'm not the rational person here. I, I, <laughs> it's quite an admission. <laughs> it, it is. I don't think any of this is a waste of time. I think it's good to talk, talk through these things. I hope that we move forward, and I hope we can put this behind us yes. so uh, we can deal with so many other things. Just for a second, for a second, think about the fact that we spent, and this is partially my fault because I brought it forward, so I'll take, you know, we, we spent, what, three hours? on civility and three minutes on 1.31 billion dollars i mean just put that in perspective here it's it's a little disconcerting and i'm not assessing blame anywhere that's not here nor there just everyone please you know for us on the board that you know as well as and the audience you know just try to be kind to one another i guess is all i'm saying thank you That's a good message. I did not expect to come from you, but you thank you not. for that. <laughs> Commissioner Smith? Do you have any report? No report. He just... Let's go home. All right. No. And I have no report, but we have an executive session, so i got to 
So this meeting, we can't end this meeting till we go to executive session. So um, you want me just to start reading, Ms. Yes. Bentley? Yes. It's authorized by Section 286.001, Section 8, Florida Statutes of Brevard County Board of County Commissioners will now commence a private attorney-client privilege meeting discussing strategy related to litigation expenditures in the case of Williamson et al. versus Brevard County 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, case number 17-15769, DC case number 6, colon 15, CV 01098JA, DCI. The names of the persons attending the private attorney-client meeting are Rita Pritchett, County Commissioner, District 1, Brian Lober, County Commissioner, District 2, John Tobias, County Commissioner, District 3, Kurt Smith, County Commissioner, District 4, Christina Znardi, Chair of the County Commission, District 5, Frank Abate, County Manager, Eden Bentley, County Attorney, Frank Mary Esquire, Bell and Roper, PA, Outside Counsel, Michael Roper, Esquire, Bell and Roper, PA, Outside Counsel, Margaret Sheffield, Court Reporter, Hughes B. King, Reporting Services, Inc., Marjorie Sassine, Court Reporter, Hughes B. King, Report Services, Inc., she's the alternate. Private attorney client meeting will be held in the county manager's conference room, third floor of building C at the Brevard County Government Center, 2725 Judge Fran Jamison Way, Vieira, Florida. The estimated length of the private attorney client meeting is one hour or less. I'll then entertain a motion to temporarily adjourn and so reconvene moved. in the county manager's conference room. Second. A motion by Commissioner Lober, second by Commissioner Pritchett. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Now, what if I would have said convene in the kitchen or the bathroom? Actually, you would have already approved it. I have to actually go to the bathroom. So. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.